So today, uh, brand new season, brand new series, brand new community groups. We're excited about that. We're going to kick it off all this way. Um, I want to introduce you to a guy by the name of Zha Jiang, who was born in Beijing, China, <clears throat> came to the U.S. in high school, and he had a dream. His dream was kind of spurred on by um, a talk that he watched uh, Bill Gates give. And it formed this dream in him that he one day wanted to be an entrepreneur, and by the age of 30, he wanted to purchase Microsoft. He was going to invent something so incredible and be paid for it that he was going to be unbelievably wealthy. He was going to be the next Bill Gates. So after high school, he uh, earned a degree in, um, he earned a degree in uh, computer science. He got his MBA from Duke. And during his college years, he saw a picture that he had of himself wearing those tennis shoe roller skates. Anybody, you know, they were four wheels, you know, anybody have those in the 80s? I did, okay, because I was cool. Um, and he, it spurred an idea in him. What if you could invent a shoe that you could walk on, and then it also had wheels so you could skate on it too? So he drew up these prototypes, and he ran it by a bunch of people that, that he respected and trusted. His uncle was one of those people. He, he, he not only respected his uncle, he kind of feared his uncle. And so when, he, when his uncle saw these drawings and Jaws like, what, what do you think? His uncle kind of gave him a verbal smackdown. Like, who would buy that? That's, that is so dumb. I mean, invest your time wisely in something else. And so Ja took his drawings and put them in a drawer and left them there, never to be pulled out again. Two years later... <clears throat> Roger Adams patented a similar idea that we know today as Healy's. Uh, just after its IPO in uh, 2007, Healy's was valued at $1 billion. Now, not saying that Ja was like, oh, if I would have got there first, my, you know, my product would have been better or just as good. But clearly, because of fear... The fear of risk, the fear of rejection, the fear of, fear of failure. He missed an opportunity because he didn't even try. So at the age of 30, he was working for a Fortune 500 company with a decent income, married with their first kid on the way. And you would think with all that going for him, he'd be pretty happy. And he wasn't. He was miserable. As he tells his story, because he had this dream of being an entrepreneur, he was just miserable. His wife told him, quit your job then. I mean, they're expecting their first kid. You do the stable, solid thing at that point, right? She said, for six months, you live your dream and give it everything you've got. And at the end of six months, if there's no traction, then yes, we'll go back to this life that we have, which is a, a good life. But in six months, if there's traction, then maybe we'll keep going. And the thing that Ja realized was he now had to confront the fear of rejection, the fear of failure that he had dealt with all of his life. And so he did what anybody else would do. He googled fear of rejection. And what he ran across was this thing called rejection therapy. It, it kind of sounds like what it is. Uh, what you try to do is every day you get someone to say no to you. You try and get rejected every day so you no longer fear it. You just kind of get used to rejection and you kind of get numb to it. So you're no longer controlled by the fear. So here's what he did. He went on this journey of 100 days of rejection. So every day he asked people for kind of ridiculous things so that they would say no to him. Let me just give you a short list. Um, he went into Abercrombie & Fitch, you know, the store that has like the really good looking live mannequins, and he asked if he could be one of those live mannequins in the window, and he got rejected because he didn't have a six pack. He asked for, a, he was at Five Guys Burgers, and you know how you get a refill on your drink at like any fast food? He went to the counter and asked if he could get a burger refill. He went to his uh, neighbor's house. He was a stranger. I mean, he didn't know the guy. He went to his house, knocked on his door, and asked him if he could play soccer in his backyard. He went to a police officer he did not know and asked if he could sit in the driver's seat of his car. He met strangers on the street one day and asked if they could exchange secrets. Hey, could I tell you a secret, and then maybe you could tell me one of yours? Um, now, mind you, all the time, he's just trying to get rejected. He's going to ask a question so someone will tell him no. He eventually went to a, um, a municipal airport where they had private planes and asked a guy, can I fly your plane? Um, 
he doesn't have a pilot's license. He also went to the Apple store and asked if they could fix his PC. Um, one of those days, though, he got this idea to show up to a Krispy Kreme and ask them a question just so he could get rejected and get a no. Watch it. I'm driving to a Krispy Kreme. Uh, I'm going to, well, I know, I just got my hair cut yesterday. I look like a, a Viet Cong from the 1960s. Uh, it's okay. Uh, I'm going to grow into it or uh, my hair is going to grow into me either way. Uh, I'm driving toward Krispy Kreme. I'm going to ask them to make me some specialized donuts. And uh, we'll see what happens. What kind of specialized donuts are you talking about? I like to have a... Uh, Getting a, uh, you link the five dones together, make them look like Olympic symbols. Oh. And when are you looking to these? Huh? When? Uh, the next uh, 15 minutes. Just normal, normal color is fine. You want this linked? Yeah. I don't know if we can do that. I got it. I, I didn't even pay attention to the Olympics this year. <laughs> no, just uh, you got the five donuts together, look like a uh, Olympic like, symbol. Was it this way this year? Something like that. That would work. Just link any five donuts together. It's going to be awesome. It's going to take me longer. How long? Because I've got to catch them on the other side. And then they've got to get through the proofer and then drop the fryer. It was the red, the red, blue, green, yellow. What's the other color? Uh, red, green, yellow, blue. Maybe white. Was it white? Could be. That sounds right. Oh my gosh, I haven't watched the Olympics in so long that I'm. I may not be able to link them, but uh -huh. I can maybe make them look. Like they're interlinked. Okay. That would be great. Because the only thing I'm worried about is if I try to put those through the proofer, they will unsettle the okay. trays and they'll end up falling. And then once they hit the fryer, you've got a divider. And if they hit that, they're going to get stuck. You know what I'm saying? If you can make that, you're going to make my day. Yep. Let me see what I can do. Okay. Try, but what do you think? Wow. That is really good. You that sure? is really good. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's the best I could do with what we've got. No, it's good. It's, it's, uh, it's good. It's more than, uh, than I thought it would be done. Um, so, great. <laughs> All right. So, uh, Jackie? Yes. All right, I'm a fan. Thank Gosh, you. You're way too kind. No, no, you're, you're, way you're, too kind. you're really good. All right, so uh, do I pay there? Don't even worry about that one's on me. Are you serious? Dead up. Dead up. You serious? Very. Extremely. Wow. Extremely. That's my pleasure. All right, Jackie. I'll, 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 take, I'll take it. But, man, you make me really happy today. All right. Thank you. Very All right. Welcome. See you. Give me a hug. <laughs> Enjoy. Okay. All right. Thank you. See you. You're welcome. All right.
two things I want you to see there. <clears throat> He's fearless. And if you know this guy, and you, you, by the way, you can go on his site, rejectiontherapy.com, and there's a hundred days of videos. I've watched almost all of them in my research for today. Um, and you can watch them. And he's, he's terrified in most of the, the, the things he tries because he doesn't like it getting rejected. But I want you to recognize, first of all, his fearlessness. The funny thing about it, too, is this. Every now and then, he gets a crazy yes. Remember I told you he went to the airport to ask a guy if he could fly his plane? The guy said, do you have a pilot's license? He goes, no. He goes, well, okay, but I could probably show you. Let's go. <laughs> and this guy had one of those kind of helicopter planes, and he let him fly. Well, sometimes when we embrace the risk in front of us and just go for it, sometimes you'll get a crazy yes. Here's why I show you all of that. My reason is this. I think you have dreams. I know I do. And, and I think I, I not only have a dream, but I also have my current reality, which is not achieving my dream. And between my current reality and the dreams that I have are these fears and risks. So in your notes there, you'll see that I, I kind of put three columns there. And under dreams, I just put some categories. There's some relationship dreams. I mean, you have dreams for the current relationship that you have or a, a possible future relationship. You have career goals, right? Education goals. Things that you would love to see come true. You have financial dreams. Retire by this age or be out of debt by this age. And you probably have contribution dreams. Like, you know, in my life, uh, I struggled with this. And maybe you have a contribution dream that, you know what, I struggled with this. And therefore, I want to contribute to our world in such a way and help people with these issues. And I'm guessing, too, that every single person, if you have this relationship with Christ... Um, that you have a spiritual dream that says, I want to be this kind of person. I want to know who God is. I mean, really know him, not fake it, but I mean, really know who he is. I want to know parts of the Bible that I just don't understand today. I actually want to see my character formed and changed a little bit differently. Not only that, but it's not all about me. I want to see my faith actually make a difference in the world. I have a lot of people who tell me, listen, I would love to be a part of that moment in someone's life where I was encouraging them to come to church, inviting them, it, it, challenging them, like, hey, let's read the Bible or maybe join a community group. You're not even a follower of Jesus, but you're trying to get them to the place where they're saying, you know what, this whole God thing, this whole Jesus thing, I've had people tell me, I just want to be there when they cross the line of faith. I want to know that I was a part of changing someone's eternal story. Question, do you have any spiritual dreams like that? Do you ever have a hope or a desire that you would be part of a dynamic church that lived fearlessly in such a way that they were courageous, that it just kept growing and growing and blossoming? Have you ever read the book of Acts, how the church just grew like crazy? Don't you have a dream to be a part of something like that because you contributed in a significant way? Well, if that's the dream, what's our current reality? And what's our fear? Our fear of rejection, our fear of failure, the fear of risk that stands in the middle of that. So I bring all that up to say, maybe what we need to do is be a little more daring. And so we're doing this series that's called I Dare You. And the reason why is because I'm about to introduce you to a church that was in this leading city in this Roman colony. And the city was called Philippi. And Paul writes a letter to this church in Philippi that we know today as Philippians. But before you open your notes and you, um, you open to the book of Philippians, here's what I want you to do. I want you to turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 16, because it's at that moment that Paul sets his foot in Philippi for the first time, and you have to understand the backstory to understand the, Lord, the letter of Philippians. So grab your notes. I'm going to give you some fill-ins, and I'll warn you right up front, the fill-ins aren't going to come to the end of the message, but don't panic. I'm not going to preach for an hour, Okay. Here's the story. I'm in Acts chapter 16. Paul, Silas, Timothy, this trio, they're traveling from city to city telling people about Jesus. Um, and they're actively taking risks at letting themselves be known and just sharing the story of Christ. And as Paul says he goes to this one area and they thought they were going to head one direction. And in the middle of the night, Paul has this dream, this vision that there's a guy across the, the pond in Macedonia. And, he's, and the guy's in Macedonia is saying, come help us, Paul. Come help us, Paul. We want you to show up. So Paul's like, I'm taking that as a dream and a vision from God. Let's pack our stuff, change the plans. We're headed that way. And this is the moment that they arrived there. Acts chapter 16, verse 12. 
From there, we traveled to Philippi, a Roman colony in the leading city of that district of Macedonia, and we stayed there several days. On the Sabbath, we went outside the city gate to the river where we expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down and began to teach to the women who had gathered there. One of those listening was a woman from the city of Thyatira named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth. She was a worshiper of God. And what he's, mean, what he's saying there is she's not a Jewish person. She's not at a synagogue. She's actually a Gentile. And she's spiritual. And she's like, God, I, I want to know you. But she has no idea who Jesus is. So she's this worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. When she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited us to her home. She said... If you consider me a believer in the Lord, come and stay at my house. And she persuaded them. So here it is. Paul, he takes a risk in sharing the story of Jesus and walking up to these strangers to say, you're spiritual, I get it, you're here in kind of a place where most people would be praying. Let me tell you about this, this Jesus. <laughs> and she discovers having a relationship with God is actually having a relationship through Jesus. That when Paul tells this story, she's like, oh, I can be forgiven. I can release that shame and that guilt that I have. That the God that I'm talking to, I can actually know I'm talking to him because he sent his son so that I could be forgiven. That the way to heaven is actually through Jesus and being forgiven. Paul shares that story. I mean, he's, he's risking embarrassment. He's, he's risking something. His social status. She's like, yes, I want that. But not every day in Philippi was that good for Paul. He runs across this woman who won't leave him alone. Not, not Lydia, a different woman. This woman actually has an evil spirit. Here's how the story goes. Look at verse 16. Once when we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a female slave who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune telling. Are you getting this? I mean, the story's getting weird. She's got an evil spirit that allows her to somehow predict the, the future. She follows Paul and the rest of us shouting... These men are servants of the Most High God who are telling you the way to be saved. And we're not sure if she's mocking them or if she's kind of ruining this story and Paul doesn't want to be associated with her. So verse 18, she kept this up for many days and finally Paul became so annoyed that he turned around and he said to the spirit who was in her, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. At that moment, the spirit left her. When her owners realized that their hope of making money was gone... They seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. Let me give you a synopsis of what happened next. There's no trial of whether they were innocent or guilty. They just, these authorities created a riot in town. They stripped them publicly of their clothes. They took rods and beat them in their backs, both Paul and Silas. And if that wasn't enough, they then what's called flogged them, which is you have a whip of leather that has embedded glass, metal, bone, and they would grab that into their back and then rip off flesh. They were beaten and then thrown in jail. And that's where the story picks up in verse 25. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying. <laughs> now just pause for a minute. What kind of prayers would you be praying? God, get me out of here. <laughs> Or maybe the prayer of, God, why'd you let me down? Really? I've done everything to try and make you known in this city. Couldn't you have done this differently? Like, why would you do this? But that's not actually Paul's attitude. Listen to this. At midnight, uh, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. They're singing songs. And the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was such a violent earthquake and the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once all the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. I mean, they're in the midst of experiencing a miracle by God. At once all the prison doors flew open, the chains came loose, the jailer woke up, and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. I mean, that's the penalty for a Roman jailer if the prisoners escape. It is death. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself, we're all here. The jailer called for lights, rushed in, and then he fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, believe in the Lord Jesus and you'll be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in his house. 
At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Then immediately he and all his household were baptized. The jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole household. The next day, the authorities in the city who had them beat, they realized they had a problem because Paul and Silas were both Roman citizens. It is illegal to treat a Roman citizen that way if they don't have a trial. Now they're just like, we broke the law. The same punishment that we gave them unjustly could now be inflicted on us. We could be beaten, we could be whipped, and we could be thrown in jail. So they just want Paul to go away quietly. So they say, Paul, we, we're, we're done with you. You can just leave town. Paul in prison, this is a, just make this a short story. Paul in prison goes, uh, no, 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 no. You treated me in a way that you cannot treat a Roman citizen. You want me to go? Why don't you come to jail and walk me out of town yourself? And he kind of said it like this. So they do. The, um, the story in Acts chapter 16 kind of wraps up their whole experience in, in Philippi. It says this, the very last verse, in verse 40, it says, After Paul and Silas came out of the prison, they went to Lydia's house where they met with the brothers and the sisters. When it says the brothers and sisters, they met with the church. These are the people that, I mean, it's the jailer and his family, it's Lydia and his family, and anybody else who came to Christ and became a Christian in their city and encouraged them, and then they, they left. But Paul and Silas left something behind. They left a group of people that heard the story of Jesus at great risk to Paul and Silas. They left a church behind. And not just any kind of a church, but they left behind a church that firsthand saw their courage, their, their willingness to risk, their willingness to push down fear and take a, a daring chance on sharing Christ. And that courage seemed to be passed on to this church. So Paul and Silas go away, and years later, um, Paul's like, we should encourage that church back in Philippi. And so he writes a letter to the church, and uh, he just wants to encourage them. You know where he was when he wrote the letter that we know as Philippians? He's in jail again. It's believed that he's actually in Rome, not in like a dungeon jail, but more like a house jail. Like he's under house arrest, that he could actually pay for the house, and there's jail, there's like guards there around him, and he's under house arrest there, waiting trial, and very possibly awaiting execution. And so he writes a letter to the church to encourage them. And this is where I want you to go. Go to the book of Philippians, chapter 1. We're going to be in the chapter 1 for four weeks, and... Uh, I would encourage you to start reading it. Here's where I want you to go. Chapter 1, verse 12. Because I think this little section of verses, 12 to 14, summarizes the entire chapter 1. He says, Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. As a result, it's become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I'm in chains for Christ. <laughs> I mean, he's telling them. He's like, hey, I'm writing this letter to you, and I'm in prison. And when he writes that to him, can you imagine Lydia and the jailer? They're like, oh, we know how this story ends, right? There's going to be something unbelievable that happens in the prison. Paul's like, yeah, I have a captive audience. Yeah, I'm captive, but so are the guards, and so I just tell them all about Christ. He's like... Everybody now knows that I'm here because of who Christ is. And Paul gets to keep sharing with them. He, he goes on, verse 14. And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. They dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. I want to answer one question this morning. My question is this. How can one man facing hardship, suffering, impossible death inspire people to dare all the more? And here's what I want to do. I know I haven't given you a single fill-in. I'm going to give them four to you pretty quick because I know we're going to run out of time here quickly. Um, Paul's life, these Philippians saw how he dealt with jail firsthand. And then he's writing from jail and he's like, listen, every time this happens to me, the gospel just keeps spreading. And so here's what I think it is. How can one man's story inspire so many people 
that they might actually become a daring community. Um, Here's the first one. I think Paul's daring life showed his immense value of the gospel. Let me put it this way. When Lydia heard this letter read, I mean, can you imagine like, hey, we got a letter from Paul. We got a letter from Paul. Let's all gather. And I don't know if they gathered back at the river, this place of prayer, and Lydia's there and her whole family and the jailer and whoever else they've led to become Christians. And you go back through this and Lydia starts hearing this. And she knows the kind of courage that Paul has. Why did Paul get his courage? Where did he get it from? Did he just wake up one day and go, I just need to be more courageous? No, no, no. Here's what it is. Paul had an experience with God. He knew what the truth was and he was convinced of it, which meant this. He understood the value of who Jesus was. God, because of his love, sent his own son into the world, not just to be a teacher, but to be a sacrifice, that Jesus would willingly suffer and die on the cross, claiming that his death wasn't for himself, but his death was actually for us, for all of humanity, that they could be forgiven, their sins paid for. That all we had to do was believe and receive this gift of forgiveness so that we could have a relationship with God right now. And whatever we get here on earth, we get that in eternity. Relationship with God. Paul believed the gospel. He understood the value of it. So for him to say, well, I'm risking this, I'm, I'm, I'm risking my reputation, big deal. There's so much more at stake than my popularity. There's so much more at stake in the lives of people who eternally could be separated from God than me fearing risking rejection. Paul's daring life showed that he understood the immense value of the gospel. Second thing, Paul's daring life gave them confidence that God cannot be stopped despite opposition. When Paul was first beaten and thrown in prison in Philippi, Can you imagine the story that Lydia told herself? (laughs) I mean, think about it. The guy who just came and shared who Jesus was with you, you just publicly saw him humiliated, beaten, and jailed. How do you as Lydia go to other people in your town like, hey, do you want to become a Christian? And they're like, isn't that the group that your leader just got beaten and thrown in jail? Not too interested in joining your party. But then to hear the story, in the middle of the night, God showed up and showed off. Earthquake, jail doors flew open. The the cuffs fell off. The jailer himself was so struck by God in that moment that he became a Christian too. Paul's daring life gave them confidence that God cannot be stopped despite the opposition. I've been reading this for weeks and months on end now. I feel like God gave me something to share with us, uh, that I'm super guilty of, and you might be too. When we describe the place that we're at, you know, we're not in Philippi, right? Most of us probably aren't going to get beat and whipped and thrown in jail here in our valley, right? But here's how we describe our valley. You know the Silicon Valley. You know, it's a place that's not that receptive to the Christian faith. You know, the Silicon Valley, it's really hard soil here. We use kind of terminology like that. Now, the Silicon Valley, you know, this is labeled the most de-churched and unchurched place in America. De-churched, meaning that people used to go to church and now they don't anymore. Unchurched, people have never gone to church here. Most people are not receptive. They're receptive to spiritual things, but not the Christian faith, because the Christian faith is old school. Not only that, but it's exclusive. People don't want to hear an invitation to church. We say things like, been super guilty of this, you know what, only 4% of anybody in this valley goes to any kind of church. Like, so why would they want to hear your message? So we start speaking a a message of limitation, and we speak a message of doom, and we speak a message that says, you know what, your fears, they're actually real, they're rational, like, don't take the risk, because no one wants to listen to you. And we build in us a story of doom that keeps you quiet, that keeps you in the status quo, that that dream that you have of who you'll be for Christ and how you influence the world, it will keep you silent. Can we just stop telling that story? And let's tell a new story. Because jail couldn't keep the gospel bound. 
A beating couldn't keep a man quiet. Lydia looked at his life and was like, I don't know what it is about that man, his courage, his, his fearlessness, his willing to risk, but God showed up in that man's life when he was fearless. Can we change the story? Listen, God is greater than anybody's resistance to the gospel in this valley. So let's start asking and inviting and telling the story to make God known. Are we willing to take that kind of risk? If we are, then let's change the story and live into it. Do you get it? I think we've been telling a story of doom in this valley to give us a great excuse for not taking more risks. I'm kind of done with it. And I think you might be too. Because our status quo will never become our dream if we aren't willing to dare to take a risk. Third thing, I think Paul's daring life gave them confidence to push back fear and tell the story of Jesus. It's my favorite verse in chapter 1, verse 14. It says, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel Without fear. I think what Paul is saying is, hey, the, the Christians that I have in Rome, even though I'm in jail, the more I'm in jail, the more their confidence grows. And I think he's writing this to the, the church in Philippi to say, hey, I'm in jail, but you know how jail stories end, right? God shows up and shows off. And I think what he's saying is, I want you to have more and more confidence. But know this, pay attention to this, their confidence is not in Paul. W what did it say there? Their confidence in the Lord grew, and they dared all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. Fourth and final thing, Paul's daring life, I think, put risk in perspective. This verse I didn't include in your notes. Um, it's not a part of 12 to 14, but look down to verse 20. Paul gives you kind of a synopsis of how he, how he sees risk, how he sees danger. Here's what he says. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ might be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. I love that because of this. Paul's like this superhero of the faith. I mean, he's got more guts and more courage than I think anybody in the entire New Testament other than Jesus. And this superhero of the faith says, I'm hoping that in the next weeks, months of my life that I will have the kind of courage to live a daring life. He knows he's on trial for his life. Paul would be executed for his faith. But he's saying, no matter the risk, I'm going to do whatever I can, but God give me courage because fear's a reality for him too. Listen, if you've ever been a Christian, you've ever been afraid, welcome to the club. 100% of us have been afraid. If you've ever been intimidated to share the gospel, invite people to church, pray for somebody, you're in great company. Maybe change the prayer. Instead of, God, would you make this easy? God, would you, you know, bring someone else into their life? Maybe let's change the prayer. God, give me courage. Give me courage to dare to risk more. He finishes with this. He says, for me... Uh, for to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Well, what, what I think he's saying is, for me, I'm going to live like Christ. I'm going to share Christ with people. I'm going to tell the story. And whenever I do that, it, we don't win all the time, but it's, you're certainly telling the story. And it gives people an opportunity to say yes to that. So for me to live, I'm going to live like Christ. And I'm going to tell a story. And if I die, to die that just means I'm going to heaven. I win then too. Paul's like, in my life, whether I live, whether I die, I'm going to win either way. Because at that moment, if they take my life, I will be in the presence of God for e eternity. He puts risk in perspective to like, you know, if, if I live or if I die, I win both ways. What can people do to you? There is no fear that can control you. And I just know this, for a lot of us, risk is unbelievably intimidating that we fear rejection we fear our status changing we fear this risk what if people will say no so what i think the story of one courageous person who values the gospel believes that god is greater than the obstacles and fear 
and has courage and confidence to tell themselves a, to live out this better story and puts risk in perspective, one person's story can inspire a group of people. Could you imagine what it would look like at Church on the Hill and in this valley if an entire church said, I'm willing to dare to risk even more? I think this hard soil is no match for what God can do through us and in us. So, here it is. Let's just finish. I dare you. I dare you to risk rejection for the sake of making Jesus known. I dare you to ask the question, what is my spiritual dream, my faith dream, how God wants to use me? I dare you to ask that question. I dare you to take an honest assessment that says, what is my current status? What is my reality? And I dare you to ask the question, what fears do I have? What risks am I intimidated by to say, God, how do I get from here to there by powering through these things that I'm afraid of? I dare you to read the book of Philippians. <laughs> Start reading chapter 1. I dare you to read it all week. I dare you to join a community group. Because you know why? It's not about being in the group. It, it, it's about the growth that you're going to have there. Because if you notice, if you're new to our church, in those notes that are kind of in your hands right there, in that program, there's all these questions. And the groups, people get together and they discuss those. Here's why. You'll forget 99.9% .9 of everything I've said today by tomorrow morning, if not sooner. I know it's really encouraging for pastors, but the point is that if you get together with a group of people to discuss these things, you work on those questions ahead of time, then show up to your group and you're sharing, it will stick with you and very possibly become life transforming for you. So I dare you to join a group and I dare you when you show up to be the real you, not a fake you, the real you. There are no perfect people who will show up to your group and so don't try and show up and, and be one. I dare you not to play it safe. In this brand new season as we go forward, I dare you to just try it differently. Maybe this will inspire you. I dare you to take that verse, chapter 14, uh, chapter 1, verse 14, and just memorize it. It's right here. Commit this to memory. Ready? Let's read it all together. Ready? Loud, passionately. Ready? And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. I want to put this in front of you multiple times a day. You know the one thing you look at more than anything else in your entire life? Yeah, your phone. Um, so on the next page you'll see there's social media things on here. You can uh, just go to these sites. You can download this, and there's a screensaver there. And if it's on your screensaver, I don't put it there so that you'll walk around at your business and be like, look at my screensaver, look, I go to church. Like, just let that inspire you so that you can commit this in the next four weeks to memory. Here's why. I think if we put God's will in our heart, I think it starts changing us. And we keep having that risk front and center in our lives. So there it is. I dare you to do all these things. Let's do this together and see what God might do among us. You with me? Let's pray. God, thanks. Thanks for, uh, thanks for a daring person like Paul. And for a daring church in Philippi. And that when people step out in your name to make you known, that you show up and show off in amazing ways. And sometimes, God, we ask you to take the first step and do something amazing. But I think Paul was continuously trying to take this first step, just trusting that you were going to show off, show off with power in his life. And so, God, would you do that? Help us dream. Help us think about the kind of Christians that you want us to be. And help us to be fearless and risk so that we would dare to make you known. And if you agree with that, would you say amen?